Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. Welcome back. Thanks to you, the podcast continues to grow. There are a lot of unapologetically unattached people out there, and I suspect there will be more when the pandemic ends. With that in mind, I'm starting to develop the solo community. I'll be hosting some live Zoom events where you can communicate with others about single living. If you want to join, please go to the solo podcast page at petermcgraw.org to sign up. That is the solo podcast page at petermcgraw.org. This episode was taped at the beginning of the pandemic before the full shelter-in-place orders went into effect. I sit down with two solo comedians, Neil Brennan and Alonzo Bowden, who suddenly have a lot more time on their hands. We have a far-reaching conversation that, frankly, is difficult to sum up, so I'm not going to try. I will say that it was fun to hear them speak frankly and unapologetically about comedy, relationships, dating, and their solo lifestyle. If you stick around to the end, they give some advice about how to have a conversation with dates about your solo life. I hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get started. Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's first guest is Alonzo Bowden. The winner of season three of NBC's Last Comic Standing, Alonzo is a touring comedian and a regular on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Welcome, Alonzo. Thank you, Peter. Our second guest is Neil Brennan. Neil is a stand-up comic, writer, director, actor, and co-creator of Chappelle Show. You can find his recent special, Three Mics, on Netflix. Welcome, Neil. <sighs> wow. Hello. Well, hello there. <laughs> <laughs> so... We go back, the three of us go back, you guys may go back much further, but the three of us go back 10 years. Is that, is that, is, it's been 10 years? It's been 10 Since years. Since fateful lunch at that pub in, in uh, Toronto, uh, Montreal. 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 Wow, and, uh, I didn't only, realize it's been that long. And only Alonzo looks exactly the same. At 30 pounds heavier, but I'll take <laughs> Are you really? At least, yeah, it's ridiculous. Oh, really? Why? Yeah. Age and just, I don't, you know, that you get older, you start putting on weight and you fight it and it still comes because I haven't, I haven't changed my eating habits. That's why. My oh metabolism, yeah, I have. Metabolism. Yeah. You eat healthy as can yeah. be, but my meta you know, your metabolism yeah. changes and the eating habits don't. So I fight it. I'm sorry to hear it. I, um, I'm, I'm leaning more towards Neil's way of eating these days and it's had a profound effect yeah i'm gonna laugh when we all die <laughs> what is just the, so, uh, let's get it out of the way right now if we all die of coronavirus then i fucking won yeah you did <laughs> <laughs> yeah you did motorcycle <laughs> motorcycle eating garbage yep you won you yeah. sure did buddy i was i wasn't sure did you do you, do you drive over here or do you take your motorcycle i drove only oh. because i've ridden the last few days but it's just Riding in the rain is tiring. Mm. You know, it's fun to a point, but then it just gets annoying. Why? Because so. you have to be too alert? No, it's not that. You got to put on all the rain gear and stuff to stay warm and dry. Oh, interesting. Like it, when when I was a kid, right? When I was young and didn't have anything, then riding in the rain, you'd freeze your ass off. But then you you grow up and you get smart and you buy the right gear. So it will keep me warm and dry, but it's a pain, you know, getting in and out of the yeah, suit and it. all of that. So it's just easier to jump in the car. I figured. And also, you know, no traffic. It must be yeah. fun. That it is. Must be actually, fun, yeah. riding in the rain is actually fun. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought that. Hmm. Um, so just to complete this thought. So you, are you still vegan? Neil? Yeah. I'm mostly vegan. Sometimes mostly I vegan. cheat at dessert, okay. but I haven't had meat. I had meat in my mouth four years ago. <laughs> Did it accident. make it all the way down? Oh, it didn't. No, go I I put it in my. It was <laughs> somebody put. I was work, I was helping on the Daily Show, and we were in Philadelphia, and somebody like a donut company sent donuts, and then I put one in my mouth and was like, "Why does this taste like batteries?" And they there There's, was bacon. I on figured, it. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm not a, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I just have switched to a very heavy. 
fruit and vegetable mm-hmm. base to my diet. So I basically have, anytime I would eat a sandwich, I've swapped it out for a salad with a protein on it. And it has, you know, in a year, helped transform my body. It's wild. From what to what? Just like from skinny fat. Yeah. To know, just skinny. To just skinny. Yeah. <laughs> So I've been fasting a lot. That's, I enjoy that. I actually have a a podcast that came out on, um, eating for a remarkable life and it, and in it, the, we talk a little bit about fasting and the value that fasting has Mm -hmm. in part just to, um, restrict calories. Yeah. And then the other thing that, that the, the guest, her name's EC Sinkowski. She has this thing called the 800 gram challenge. So her thing is basically, Want, she just wants you in the course of the day to eat six cups of fruits and vegetables all in, in some way, yeah. shape, or form. And the thing about it is, and, and I didn't anticipate this when I made the change, is that when you eat a lot of vegetables especially, it just keeps you full. Like it just crowds out a lot of other eating that you might do otherwise. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm not the, I'm not going to sit here and say like I'd never eat a vegetable. This, better be, this better be good. <laughs> I'm not that guy. I'm not saying I you never monster. eat a vegetable. I just say that I do eat meat. It's got a lot of sauce regularly. on Regularly. And no, I, it, the funny thing about eating vegetables is when I eat them, it's almost like there's a craving for more of them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that. And, and what you said, I really get it when you talked about, um, having meat like you recognize right away like something's wrong yeah like i'm like that with alcohol like i don't drink i haven't drank in forever and if i have something and someone put alcohol it, right away it it just literally i'm mm. like what yeah like that? what yeah you know which is what which is what alcohol take that's the natural response to alcohol right you have yeah alcohol everybody is else yeah. acts like that like yeah it tastes good i've been i've never done this joke but alcohol is like uh drinking alcohol is like giving oral sex you're not there for the taste. <laughs> you know, the, um, the outcome's fun, but you're not. The taste is not why you're there. The uh, that's another thing that I've done is I'm I'm drinking almost not at all now. And when you think about drinking, you're basically just it's just pure sugar. Yeah. And we know we now know that that's well, got side effects. Yes. Indeed. That's why you drink it. <laughs> yeah. You don't drink it that. for the sugar. You drink for the side effects. Yes. You, know? yes. you drink. But for at the some aftermath. point, the sugar doesn't. Is not worth the side effects anymore. Yeah, but that's again, that, I mean, uh, speak for yourself. I think that for most people it is. No, no, that's what I mean. For most, yeah, people, for me, it, it's, right. That's yeah. what I was going to say. That's an individual choice because a lot of people are like, yeah, and and it's like anything else, right? There's a um, a limit to how far you go. Yeah, where it becomes a, anything becomes destructive after a certain amount. Yes, I was eating ice cream every night, and then I realized like you got to stop. So I think this is a good segue into. Just talking Can a little I stop bit about and say I can't imagine a fat Neil Brennan. <laughs> it's like, no possible. How much, like, you know, I know I you mean, can't. Like, even even a quart of Haagen Dazs a day. It would just no. Just I the can get, I could gain ten pounds a in a week if just, I needed to. But that's not. I guess because I've never fat, seen then. you different than the way you look now. Because so. it means something to me, <laughs> Alonzo. Yes, <laughs> I'll be sure to take a picture of the two of you just yeah, so please. for yeah. people to get an idea of of the contrast here. Um. No offense. I didn't mean that. In I have a. I, don't I have an observation. Is, yeah. We keep getting We're, sidetracked, but I have an observation about the podcast, which is, um, I realize. <laughs> first of all, I realized listening to the podcast that I'd never heard you laugh. Really? Yes. Not the way you laugh on the podcast, because I know what I think. Because when you get around comedians, I think you're a little uh, defensive. Is not the right word, but you don't want to be Cautious. too. You don't want to be too uh, earnest. Oh, that's interesting. I, I and told- I've also realized that around most people, you're the funny one. In the podcast. Just in the world, you're the funny one. Oh, I in see what you In most conversations, mean. you're the funniest person in the conversation. But when I'm with comedians, yeah, I'm not. Yes. And so then I just lean and into the knot. And never forget it. <laughs> don't worry. I knew, that, I knew I'd be the least funny person in this room. <laughs> the uh, Well, actually, it's, I have an unusual laugh. That's and, what I mean. That's I was like, oh my god! I think maybe I'd heard it once. That, really? Yeah, because it's so, it's so unbridled. It's it's lovely. It really is. Thank you. I appreciate it. I've been told that I'm an easy laugh, and so this hearing you say that is, is surprising. But maybe I just sort of have my kind of lab coat on a little bit yeah. more when I'm hanging out with comedians. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm glad you like the take your podcast. lab coat off. Peter. Yeah, I, I'll try. <laughs> um. Okay. So. Let's talk. So this idea of talking about food is relevant, right? So there's three bachelors in the room here. Do you guys like the term bachelor? 
No, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Which, which, what was the? We had a conversation about being single that that was contributed to start you starting the podcast, right? Did you tell me that? No. What happened? Well, I think what happened was I ended up reaching out to you because I heard you talking about being single. Oh, right. On Theo Vaughn's podcast, yeah. and I, I reached out to you, and I had I had been. I think I had just launched the podcast. Got it. And I had realized it's funny because, like, you know, what's interesting, I think, about the three of us is so, for the listeners who don't know this, um, Neil Alonzo and I got connected when I first started studying comedy. And so I met Neil at a bar in Montreal during the Just for Laughs Festival Mm -hmm. because I recognized him from a skit on Chappelle's show from the the frontline Clayton Bigsby skit where your head explodes. Right. And then I was like, oh my God, this guy Fuck is like... Guy. He's the guy. He's the guy. Um, and I write about you in my book, Stick to Business, um, in, a, in a couple of different ways. And I'll, I'm going to return to that. And then I met Alonzo through an NPR story about my first paper about what makes moral violations funny. And we, yeah. we were recorded talking about it. And then I approached Alonzo... And asked him he, if he would critique the paper. And he wrote a really thoughtful critique of my paper that's on my blog, which I'll put in the exhibits. And then anybody who knows me well will not be surprised to hear this. I basically have since then just forced my friendship on these two guys. And so Without well, there's, no other, there's no other <laughs> word for it. There is, yeah. There's no other that word for it. That is an accurate description. I've changed my number several times. <laughs> And this the motherfucker always finds me. I moved. He hired I a moved. detective agency at one point. Like, yeah. And so the nice thing about these guys, besides being pros and funny and thriving in the business, um, is they they always say yes. So I ask them. I ask them for a lot of things. They never ask me for anything, and yet they still always say yes. I think it's interesting that ten years later, I'm launching this non comedic project about living a remarkable life as a single person. And it just so happens that, that my sort of first two close connects in comedy mm-hmm. are doing exactly that. Yeah. Well, the, you know, getting back to your thing about the term bachelor, that just sounds so old fashioned to me. Like I don't think about it. Yeah. Like Joe Namath a is a bachelor. Right. It's a label that you yeah. don't use anymore. It's not as old as spinster. But it's along the way. But it's the it's the male spinster. <laughs> it's the male spinster. It is the male yeah. spinster. I mean, it has a more positive connotation than spinster, though. It's got a sexual connotation, but it's but the problem with that is sex is culturally out of favor <laughs> right now, <laughs> uh, especially for men. As so, just in terms of the timing of this podcast, because there's already been some. It's 2020. <laughs> Louis C.K. <laughs> is doing a five year sentence. In cultural jail. <laughs> Bill Cosby. Yeah. We're about seven days into the hysteria around the corona pandemic. So right. But we're not, I don't think we're talking about it like that. Like when you talk about Bachelor and the sexual connotation of it, that might apply, like you, like you said about Joe Namath, like a guy in his 30s who's banging a lot of chicks and, you know, yeah. ha- and back in the day hanging out at the Playboy Mansion. Yep. That was a bachelor life, right? Going to we lanes on the Upper the, East Side. The bachelor and, was yeah. the guy that the married guys were like, oh, I oh, wish I were got, him. I got to talk to you for a second. What are you? You must be, man, you must be putting him away <laughs> two, at, two at a time. <laughs> That's the connotation to me of the, of the term bachelor. I just look at it like I just never been married. Yeah, That's, I get it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, what you're saying is you're not banging. <laughs> Uh, well, no, term, I know you. I mean, no, I know you. Okay. No, I don't. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. Technically, I, I guess I, I am. But yeah, I, I, uh, I can go both ways. I mean, I don't. I'd be surprised if I got married at this point. Um, no, I'm not against it. I'm against kids, but I'm not against marriage. I don't see the advantage at this point. But the I'm almost a bachelor's rights advocate. Okay. Rights advocate in that in that I just think that it's women people feel bad for women who are not married and they think men who are not married at our age are pigs a little bit. Not explicitly, but uh if there's a single woman her the a couple is happy to have her around. If there's a single man, the man's happy to have him around. 
but the woman's not. Uh, okay, so let's unpack this because I do yeah. think I think there's a, there are first of all there's I don't think there's any good term for a single man or a single woman. I think bachelor's as good as it gets for a guy, and I don't think there is even a good term for a, for a woman at this point. Agreed, and. So you know the the choice of solo was my attempt. Solo is a great title. Solo is a great. That's a, the best word for it. Yeah, because solo doesn't imply judgment. Yes, and it's it's it it's sort it of adventurous implies, too. Uh, heroism in a way. It's mm-hmm. the same way that when a woman's single in her forties, it's a choice, and she's strong, and she's a feminist trailblazer, and all this stuff. Whereas a man is a pig. Yeah. So, yeah. Although. That's what people will say about the woman to her face. <laughs> and then when they leave, like, oh, that's too bad. She yeah. can't find somebody. Right. You know but what I mean? I, like for women, I think women are still treated as if it's somehow a failure if they're not attached, yes. especially by 40. Agreed. That, you know, and, and if they're 50, then, well, you got to be divorced or. Because they got all that baby equipment. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's that baby building. It's definitely a different judgment. It is, yeah. I mean, they both lean negative. I think the 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 woman's is is around this idea of failure. What's wrong with you? Why don't you have these kind of priorities? And then when a man gets judged negatively, it's because you don't want to settle down. Yeah, the Peter Pan right. you're phenomenon. Sexually, you're, you you're emotionally immature. Yeah, and uh, sexually aggressive. Yes, and and <clears throat> the more the guy has his act together, um, the more that he gets that judgment. Which I think is interesting. Yeah. I, uh, yes. I have a friend, a uh, female, and she said, the worst thing about guys like us, she said, you don't need a woman. Yeah. You've learned how to live. You can actually cook and clean and just like the basic, I guess, life skills that I just thought like, well, yeah, I'm an adult. Yeah, I picked them up at 16. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I, I just didn't was, throw them away. I never, of, had, I never pretended I didn't know them. It was part of not laying in the corner of a department and dying yeah. you know, that I picked up these skills. But she said to a woman, that's tough because it's now like, what does he need? Yeah. Right. But I think that that's the, you know what I need? A cool motherfucker. Is yes. what I need, and I don't need a cool motherfucker in that. Like, you gotta you know, look, baby. I'm gonna go. Out, I'm gonna be out on the streets, and you gotta let me. I'm not. It's not about fucking all the time. It's about understanding that I don't need you. So anything you bring has got to be additive, and it can't just be a uh, some sort of governor on my behavior. Yeah, I had you know I had this experience. I have an ex. A woman who we all do, Peter. Go ahead. <laughs> Look at him brag. In our business. <laughs> Look at him brag. In I our business, Peter. I have an ex. There's one thing that everyone on the solo podcast has in common: <laughs> is that we all have an ex. You were saying. Uh, so we we started dating, and I told her very early on, right away, that I didn't want to have children. And we did. You know, we continued dating despite that. But I think I think deep down she wanted that. And I and the evidence I have is she's had a child. Mm-hmm. But um, at one point, her mother, named Peter, who met, who who had met me after meeting Studying me for the science. first time, <laughs> after meeting for the first time, said to her, "He doesn't need you." Your mother did? No, her mother said to her, "He doesn't need you." And, wow, uh, that's dramatic. And, and I know it was like, and then she told me this, which I wasn't. I, I wasn't How did say, she say it? Did she? She did say it? it like that. Like you're going to have a hard time. I think the implication was. You're going to have a hard time with this one because he doesn't need you. Wow. And because, you know, and when you think about it, though, historically, marriage wasn't about romantic love, right? That's a fairly new invention. Yeah, it's 80 years. Marriage was about a partnership in order to get through the winter and not to starve to death yep. and to have a system to, to grow the corn and, to, you know what I mean? And to, um, it was yeah. about I, labor. I like to not go back that far because you know <laughs> no. black, black people wasn't doing so great. I'm not. Back well, I'm not. I'm not so saying let's not, no. the well off way. whites were fine in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you though. That's See, a I'd good, that's a good reminder, especially in <laughs> the south. I'm from the south, I've been, I've been set up and here, and <laughs> I'm from Mississippi. And my my point is 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 that and and actually I think it's still in many ways a contractual thing. Like from a sort of patriarchal s- standpoint, it's like. The guy goes out, makes the money. The woman takes care of the household. That still happens today. And so there is an exchange beyond you're great. Well, and I just want to spend time with well, you, the, which yeah. is what you're looking for. That's, 
that's always an option, right? That that's something that as a woman, that option is always there. I can choose to be a wife and let him earn the money and support the house and live based on that, you know, um while you're the, young though. Yeah. That's right. Well, so. not even no, not even because childbearing. There's always a guy. There's I've, always a guy for any for just about any woman, you know what I mean? There's some guy who will be that guy. Like now it may not be their first choice. No. <laughs> right? It, you know, it's it's not you know it's, fair. it's not it's a fair. movie star, but it's the guy that if it they, might be if a movie they star. want to do that. If they want to do that. Yeah. But um The funny thing is it's sexist as a guy if you tell a woman get a job. If as a guy, you'd be a pig. If you were like, I'm not fucking supporting you. Yeah. Fucking get a job. Hmm. But, but so it's you in some ways I've thought of all the negative ways that this affects men clearly. Yeah. It does uh you know that woman's mother saying that and that is a generational thing that it's kind of like they're taught that, you know what I mean? Like find a man who needs you. See my my experience has been to meet women who are professional and have their own life and everything going on everything I like in other words their independence this and that then we get together and then it starts becoming what are we gonna do and I'm like what did you do before you met me like yeah. like how did you spend Wednesday before you met me yeah because I got shit to do Wednesday yeah you know and and suddenly they become not all but a lot they, they somehow you become more important than what they were doing with their life I heard you mention that on the maybe the first or second episode of this podcast one yes. of your family of podcasts um the th- that it goes from uh it, the, it goes to that it's so quickly like uh, the are you gonna be you're gonna keep being as independent as you are <laughs> the women say to you and you're like yeah that's what i always want to say to women is like i just met you like even if it's a year ago it's is this still a new. 40, this is year 47 Yes. Oh man, I, of I, my life. So why would I recalibrate for again? Again, I sound like a pig saying this, but but why? It's you're just some person. I, yeah, I think that yeah. The, the the experience I've had sounds similar to what Alonzo is saying. I'm sure you've had it too, Neil. Mm-hmm. Which goes something like this: is like my days are full. You know, they're full making things, writing, doing this podcast, working out, seeing friends, traveling, teaching. I don't have enough hours in the day to do all the things that I want to do. Fortunately, most of them are actually rather exciting, fun, interesting, and and make me a better, more interesting person, and thus a better partner. You know, I travel internationally well. I get to do cool things, and then I think where the attention starts to lie is you you meet someone, you connect, which is not easy to do. Mm-hmm. You start spending more time. Oh my, a small miracle. Exactly. A real connection is a small miracle. It, it is. It's not easy to do. And then there, and I'm not saying this happens with every woman I date. Actually, most of the women I date nowadays, it doesn't happen because of the type of women I date. But sometimes what happens is, oh, you're traveling again? Oh, you're doing, you know what I mean? And Oh, yeah. I, I love that one. And and so I, what I think it highlights. <laughs> Have you gotten that one, Alonzo? Okay. Well, no. The thing with me is I will tell, and and. I want to get back to something you talked about, about the timing when you talk about a year, because I've just, I'm, I may be still in a situation like that. I don't even know. (laughs) You are. But the thing with work and travel, right? And I tell everyone, I'm paid to travel. I tell jokes for free, right? I'm on a plane every Mm. week. You know the life. This is the life we have, right? And when I meet a woman, especially in LA, it'll be because I'm home for some reason. I'm home for two, three weeks. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, okay, when I start working, huh. I'm not going to be here. And then after two months of me working, they're like, you're never here. And I'm like, yeah, I told you, I'm not. Like, it's if you like going out on Tuesday nights, I'm your guy. Yeah. But if you got weekend plans, I'm, well, I'm the, not going to be Well, to that here. point, the what the pandemic has proven to me, uh, among other things, is that people cannot imagine things very clearly they cannot <laughs> believe it's hard to they anticipate can't, the future can't, they yeah. cannot picture it yeah and i feel like the thing that especially as comedians the reason once i saw the stats and the curve on on the uh on the uh corona is i've seen i've had a joke had an idea i've written it i've done it on stage 
and I've sent it out to the world. <laughs> like I know how it works. You had start something small and then it gets bigger and bigger and right. bigger. And then sometimes it's explosive. Expo- exponential. Yeah. And so you go, oh, yeah, this is going to be one of those things. It's yeah. like when you well, see a guy at a club and you're like, this guy's fucking going to be doing theaters in three months. Yeah. Well, at one How of do you know? Because he kills. One of the funniest posts I saw was Ted Alejandro, who said his wife is starting a support group for wives of comedians because they're home now. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. a, th- when we were, when we were working on the humor code there, there's this phenomenon in Japan of the company men retiring. And so they're almost all have wives. Mm-hmm. And so these guys, you know, they've been working 70 hours a week for their whole entire lives. Suddenly one day they're retired, they're exhausted and they just come home and they just sit on the couch mm-hmm. and smoke and drink and watch TV. Which is what we're doing now <laughs> during the <laughs> minus the, the smoking and drinking, but yes, but the we're these, eating vegetables. These yeah. uh, exactly, <laughs> we're gonna live forever. Well, that's, yeah. this is actually perfect. So these house, these poor housewives have been living their lives, these great lives that they have, and now they've got. And they, there's like a term they there's a Japanese term they basically call them trash. Like the men are like trash on the couch. I don't think men are trash is a Japanese term. I oh, think no. that's <laughs> universal. That's fair. Term, yeah. So what these women do, not all of of course, but on occasion, what they do is they start planning to have the guy die early. So they, they give them extra. They always make sure their glass of whiskey is filled. They leave like a little extra um, fat on the on the steak. And, you know, make sure they always have their cigarettes and all this kind of stuff, which is just like. Well, well I f- I'm enjoying watching people during the quarantine uh, who love their kids having to spend actual time with their kids. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's fascinating. You get to and see like, the- oh, but I thought they're little bundles of joy and they're <laughs> fucking amazing. And they're the greatest thing that ever happened. What? There, so yeah, th- there's a lot of teachers right now saying. See, yeah, no, yeah. see, look at your little teachers. bundle of yeah, joy now. You know? Well, I think this this goes even beyond that. Is like I think I think that the pandemic is revealing who the real heroes are, which are scientists, engineers, teachers, right? All of the people yeah. that you, yeah, but also the the if we're gonna get into this, I don't know how I, we got here. I we want to talking I actually, about relationship timing. I, but to me, it's the people grinding out the day jobs, the yes. people working at a grocery store right now. Like if you work at a grocery store and you haven't punched anyone in the head, mm-hmm. you're a hero. You are a hero. Yeah. You're a hero. If you have not physically hit someone for saying something stupid, doing something stupid, you mm-hmm. know, or if you work at a restaurant and you're not working right now or, you know, people are like, oh, you must be glad to be off while you're getting zero tips so yeah. you have no yes. income. Those are the people who are... I. That's tough. That's got to be tough. This uh, I'm going to get back to the the other stuff, but there is so this anthropologist, his name escapes me right now. I spoke about it on a previous episode. He has this really great essay that turned into a book um, called "Bullshit Jobs." Yeah, I've that guy did a lot of podcasts. Yeah, it's it's a really fascinating idea. So when we tend to think about jobs, we tend to think about the status of the jobs, right? How much pay people have, how how um, whether they're high low status jobs. Independent of status, there's the bullshittiness of the job, which is essentially, do you really create any value? And as he defines a bullshit job is even the person doing the job recognizes that the job doesn't really produce very much. That they could... It could be eliminated. It's a step, yeah. It's a step that's yeah, Well, that was the whole middle management corporate America thing, right? Yes. Where companies had 42 vice presidents. Yeah. Yes. And they were like, what are you the vice president of? Uh, uh, marketing and shipping. <laughs> so so the one thing I think, like, the other hero is the custodian, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. So you think about absolutely. that as like, you know, you're like, okay, who do you want to stop working their job right now? Who gives a shit if a middle manager stops working their job? But you don't want the custodian to stop their job. Right, because they're on the front line of this pandemic. My hope for all this is what nine eleven did for Homeland Security and and intelligence and and uh, and um, basically it, and and law enforcement. I hope this does for nurses, custodians. I hope it does for infrastructure and healthcare. I see. I hope that there is some upside to all this that people realize. I was saying to somebody last night, it would really help if a rich person died uh, in this because then it would go like, oh, you know what? He had the best medicine. He had yeah. the dud. 
he got it from a person who didn't have health care mm. and and how it benefits all of us if we all have health care. Do you want to pick the, the person? Tom Hanks. <laughs> but I think it's too late. That's too easy. Well, it's also, and when you talk about that, you know, the, the trash, the garbage men. Yes. It, those are the guys. And I remember in New York when they went on strike, everyone knew. You That's know what right. I mean? Like anyone else, go, when they went on strike, the city was like, okay, these settle are, this. These yeah, are important because people. The, because trash builds instantly. And you know, and and every problem that comes with that comes up instantly. You so. ever you remember the Red Fox story where he fired the Red Fox from Sanford and Son? He wanted uh, more black writers. This I this may be true or not. Uh, this is a story I've heard a bunch of times, but he wanted more black writers uh, on the show. So they fired all the normal writers and. And brought in a bunch of black writers, and they did a. I like one, how he says the normal writers. Uh, the no, writers. there's a punchline. <laughs> I know. There, I know. Uh, there's a punchline. <laughs> so uh, he, they, they, they hire all black writers. They have one read through. It stinks. And Red Fox yells out, "Bring me back my Jews." <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's how. That's what I was thinking when you were talking about the garbage man. Yeah. I don't know what the the uh, the 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 noun would be, but <laughs> right. Well, yeah. So let's get. No. I mean, but I think I think this point is is well taken. Like people listening have suddenly had their perspective changed about who the really important people in society are, and you know, so the yeah the, the te- unseen people that epidemiologists, keep it like, yeah, that's right, and you know, and like yeah. your nanny, for example, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and so and even you know, and that that line cook at a diner, mm-hmm. you know, and so on, and or the person who stock shelves at at Trader Joe's. So getting getting back. Let's get to back the to this idea. Solo. Part yeah. Of so, podcast, but well, Neil, I do, I'm sorry. Well, I just want to address something Neil said because Neil talked about about a year, you know, and it's funny to me the different timing they have. So I'm in a situation where I'm dating this girl, right? And after about six months, she says, "Are you seeing anyone else?" And I was like, "Well, we haven't discussed exclusivity." So in my view. We're not exclusive until we say it. And anything you do is really none of my business. Like, this I'm not going to ask you yep. where you were when I'm not around. This is the ask, don't, don't in, tell policy. In her view, we've been in a relationship because we've been sleeping together. And and it's like, well, you know, I'm not out here like you said. It, you know, I'm not 25. I'm not trying to bang a different chick every Friday. But at the same time, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. There have been situations, and, and it's funny because... In dating her, I've seen other women that I had prior plans with or whatever, and I'd be like, hmm, not interested. I'd rather be with her. So it, it kind of, in my head, it's like- It's moving in that direction. Right. Yeah. But but it's so funny, the difference in calendar, because I've talked to people about this, and every woman is like, oh, yeah, six months. Yeah, you- Why ain't she, why, why doesn't she live with you? Haven't you yeah. bought a house together yet? Yeah. And guys are like, no, nah, man, you good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, six so, months, man. That's that ain't that's half a calendar. We're, we're operating on a different calendar, and and it's a very and it you know I I regret it. I regret it because I I crazy about this woman. She's great. She gets it. Our lives fit. We've traveled together. We've done all this stuff. It's great. But if this is the thing where it's like my way or no way, I can't operate under that kind of pressure. Well, you don't want to have to make. You want to make the choice. The way you made the choice, which is having the option, I'd rather be with you. Yes. And now, having said that, when would you uh, have when, the conversation? Yeah, when is the right time to have the well, conversation? Well, it dep- different people, it's different times. But yeah. in this situation, I would say it would probably have been in the next month or two. Just, you know, just or or like, yeah, I'm here all the time. So, yeah, this is exclusive. I'm good with this because nothing's going to change. See, my my thing is always when you when you use the word relationship, boyfriend, what now what changes? What does that mean? What do I have to well, do? Well, it's now? like a level. It's like, well, it's it's settled down. All of it sounds like less fun. <laughs> well, settle, <laughs> yeah, settle so down. I had a previous guest getting who, serious. Who calls it yeah. settling in instead of settling down? Yeah. The, you know what? I think listening to you guys talk. You know, I think highlights. Go ahead. <laughs> it highlights. I think the challenge, whether it be male or female, um, with the nature of your solo living, right? So I think there are some people who are single just because they're just really terrible at relationships. 
I think there are some people who are single because it's not a priority. Mm -hmm. You know, they have other rich, robust lives. Um, and then I think that there are, there are people who are like, I'm fine with it now. And someday, you know, that may look to change. And what's happening, the stories that we're sort of telling are people who are, I'm living this rich, robust, single life. I like my life. I'd be open to something else, but I also recognize how scary, dangerous, much of a problem that can be. And then going out and interacting with people who have one particular perspective, which is need to couple up, need to get married, need to do the traditional thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that the friction lies. Yeah. Right. So two solo, like, um, people who have this kind of sort of solo perspective might be able to couple up. Like I have, I have married listeners who love the podcast because they have this sort of solo perspective within their relationship. Yeah. They don't believe that the other person has to be everything right. all the time for everyone. And so what I don't, you know, there's no, but the problem is there's no way to figure out whether someone is a Jane Austen, like, you know, perspective on the world, which is, I need to find my Mr. Whoever I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not read up on my Mr. Jane Austen. Darcy, Darcy, Darcy thank yeah. you. Um, the perfect man. And then we, we create this unit versus someone who might listen to this podcast who says, I like my life. If someone comes along who likes his life, maybe we can negotiate and figure out a way to, to do this temporarily or, or beyond. There is an element because knowing that I was doing this today, I was thinking about just my perspective. I think about it a lot, uh, irrespective of the when I'm doing it, but every morning when you wake up, there is an element, at least for me of, of why am I, why am I alone? See, you, I, you have that. I don't have that. Yeah. I still, I'm still defensive about it. I'm still defensive. I feel like in order to maintain it, to maintain, even to maintain being an artist of any kind, or or I'm sure it applies to academia as well, you need a level of anger, I think. A level of like, no, man, this is what I'm doing. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. Or else it, I feel like it becomes like, eh, a thing I do. I don't know. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I won't. So but I, to me, and I, I could be dead wrong about this, and this might be entirely personal but to me there is an element of uh defensiveness to my kind of mo yeah so i think i have a head start on you um and i think i don't know if i started tussling with these um issues earlier i had some sort of near misses in my in my life in terms of marriage and so on obviously doing this podcast has sort of accelerated kind of my beliefs mm -hmm. and solidified them some. So you had said something in that podcast that we ref referenced earlier, and I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm just going to tee you up if you don't mind. You were in a therapist's office with a girlfriend yes. and you had this breakthrough moment. I, I, I thought it was a profound. I didn't have a break. It was, she, there was no girlfriend, but yes. Go oh, ahead. okay. But this sort of notion of What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Everybody in the world just assumes there's something wrong with me, including a therapist. Yeah, she was always espousing be in a relationship. You'd be much happier. It's so fulfilling. And you said, relationship children. And, you and said, I said, what if my purpose on earth is not to be a boyfriend or a husband? Yes. And I, I think that was that's a profound idea to have. Yeah. Because... Why is it that we all need to do the same thing? We don't do the same thing in any other part the of our lives. The thing that I've thought of, uh, listen to your podcast, and there's an, there's a, also another one called Alonement, which I think is a good title. Alain de Baton was the first guest. He's amazing. Um, but uh, people will accept any sexual orientation, mm. but only one relationship orientation. That's fascinating. Yeah. I never thought It's about a joke that. I want to do, which is you could tell somebody like yeah I'm, i know this girl i shit on her chest she shits on mine are you gonna settle down no you're <laughs> disgusting <laughs> that's a great joke yeah, you're you're disgusting <laughs> you're an animal well 
<laughs> What's and, your reaction to that, Lonzo? Well, it's a great joke. No, no, I no. mean... It, <laughs> uh, D- different things. So I, I get what you're saying. You got you're my full defensive. laugh there. Yeah, I know. I've got it. We've got it twice now. <laughs> and in talking, like my therapist that I go to, she gets that she's like, well, you might not be a relationship person. Now, as far as what you said about our art and defending it, my highest calling to me is being a comic. Uh huh. Like that comes first. Back when I first started, and it was funny because I was dating a girl who gave me to add to a comedy class that got me started in the whole thing, you know? And she said, she was very insightful because I was only in it a couple of years. She said, you're never going to get married. Said, Any woman's only going to be your mistress. Yes. This is your wife. Yeah. And, and it was amazing that she spotted that at that time. Now, and in, she set you down that path also. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's amazing and, that you didn't marry her. Because that, <laughs> that really, well, you know, she she'd was, be the best one. She was my craven first, you are. She was my first accountant, so she always joked that I didn't get the man, I did get his money. There That's you go. Funny. You, know. you know, the um, the the podcast that you and I taped is I call it Married to Comedy yeah, with Alonzo absolutely, Bowden. Absolutely, but the, recently with the therapist, a thing came up, a different relationship types or whatever, and and mine is avoidance. In, a, in yeah. other words, that's my way of relating. There's always this avoidance thing that you that I have to be aware of, right? And and I remember a friend of mine, really like more sister than friend who I've known forever. When she got married, she said, "You know, when I'm with him, the two of us become more." Yeah, I've been. In, I've and, had that, and I was like, to me, it was like. I've never even thought of that. Like that, you know what I mean? Like that yeah, idea. Yeah, the first time I fell in love, that happened. I was like, oh. Yeah, see, to me, that idea never even occurred. I was like, wow. I mean, I was really happy for her. It was like, that's fantastic. I was like, yeah, I never think in those terms. Well, I've never thought of it that's, uh, in those terms. That's the interesting thing about, um, about, uh, about like marriage and all, or, or divorces. When you get divorced and then you have to give your wife half of your earnings. Whenever I hear that, I think I've never had a girlfriend contribute to my earnings yeah, in the slightest. Yeah, I could see when I've, I've had women uh, hinder them <laughs> with, with guilt yeah. and shame about how much I'm working. I had a girlfriend who, looking back, was not right for me but she kind of wanted me to retire and this is five years ago to just focus on her full time yeah which is again i don't think that's comp i don't think that's typical but but uh i think there's something to this being comedy being very fulfilling and and demanding and very demanding Correct. You know, and, and people who don't do it or who don't have something, an, an equivalent passion or even close to, don't understand what that is. Like I always say that if you're a real comic, you have to do comedy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if you get on a TV show or if you get, you know, yeah. any of the outside multi million dollar, I call it lottery success. If you're a real comic, you're still like, man, I, I got to get on stage. Yeah. I got to. I have to do this. I I can't. I tell people I can't not do this. Yeah, I see. I don't know how to not do. Now I've never had a woman come close to saying don't do it or get in the way of it or anything like that. And getting back to what you said about the whole divorce alimony thing, I've always been like, I can't see why I have to support an adult like that. That's ridiculous yeah. to me. I get you're a grown adult, like because you met her. You know, yeah. I mean, I could see you because you support, felt things for her. You got to so support now, kids, you know. Yeah. And being black, I get out of that. Right. So that's another right. bonus. So there's another that, one. Another great <laughs> bonus to being black. Oh, we're gonna Put catch that hell on for the that. Pile. I'm gonna catch Zero hell for saying it. You catch hell for laughing at it. But in we terms don't. of paternity, <laughs> unless you're in the league. If yeah, you're in the then league, then you, you. got to pay. Well, you're on TV. You're on TV 82, 82 nights a year. And then but, 100 at the playoff. But no, it's um that that thing of society, what you're talking about, saying you have to be in a relationship and a relationship is normal. I've never felt that pressure. I think another reason is my parents never put that pressure on me. A lot of people get that from the parents. Like, when are you going to get married? Yeah, I never when got it I either. have grandkids, this and that. And my parents never got on me about that. Someone even asked my mother about that, about what about him 
blah, blah, blah. And she, and oh, it was a white girl. What if he marries a white girl? And my mother was like, he got to live with her. Like whoever he marries, yeah. I don't care. That's she, always the thing with know? any interracial or gay marriage. It's like, hang out. They got to fucking hang out, man. Yeah. Like yeah, you're so, upset and all that. They, that's, they got the hard, the right. hard part. So my, my, I never got that pressure from my family that a lot of people do that you got to have, yeah. get married, have a kid. I want a grandkid, blah, blah, blah. Did you have, uh, like, were your parents good role models? And my parents to, were, to, you know, old school working parents, right? You know, not a lot of I love you, but the love came from providing. But it was like, go to school, do whatever. My mom, well, my mom provided me my sense of humor. My mom's the funniest person I ever knew. Without her, I'm not this. Yeah. You know, I laughed with my mom. I mean, literally, when she was dying of cancer and in chemo, she we would it. still you laugh. You were laughing and laughing, and she was crying a lot, so please stop laughing. Well, yeah, but, you know, she didn't mind. I got a bit or two out of it. Great. No, I, that so in that respect, yeah, that was all mom. And know? then, and so, Neil, you, obviously, you you come, well, people may not know this, you come from a very big family. Yeah, the youngest of 10. Youngest of 10, and um, in, in three mics, you, you talk. Uh, alcoholism, depression, uh, violence. See, I did all that on my own. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Didn't have nine others no. to help. I, uh, uh, so, yeah. So, that. Do you think that the, and what I'm asking is, did that, has that fed a bit of this sort of, this idea that you just haven't, I mean, the comedy aside, like, even if you weren't a comic, do you think that you'd have this, like, ah, this idea of marriage and forever might. I think a lot of it is. I didn't, my parents' relationship was not good. It was not fulfilling for either of them. I mean, it'd and be hard for it to be with 10 or not. Don't put that on us. It was them. Um, <laughs> well, they made the decision. They made it. No, no, no. But uh, my dad didn't want kids. My, my mom wanted kids. My And, the, you know, my dad, they were just, they were born in 1930 and 1933. They did yeah. what they, they were followed told. the norms. They, to- they did what they were told. They followed the rules. The, and the Catholic they church did not like it. Yeah. My mom loved it. My mom loved having kids because she was an only child, et cetera. But, but my dad didn't like it. And he, uh, he, he reminded us of it every day. <laughs> so I didn't have a positive experience with the my brother and sisters were all really great to me my it just wasn't a good situation though. sure yeah yeah no I, I mean i for as an aside um that so for, in three mics neil does standard comedy does set up punchline jokes he does one-liners and then the third mic he does uh, emotional stuff yeah and uh i encourage people to watch the special it's it's fantastic like I, I sat in my living room and cried watching right. watching that, um, because it was just so raw, yeah, and authentic, um, and it it just explained helps explain who you are yeah. in many ways, yeah. Um, well, and- um, really quick on the subject of three mics, I think it's one of the things that, and I'm going to go fanboy or whatever you want to call it, but one of the brilliant things about Neil Brennan is to think of doing that. Yes. Right. Because as a comic and as a person, yeah, I have those three sides or others do, but you took it on, you figured it out and you broke it down and you took it on stage and and made it work. And Mm -hmm. it was very insightful and very personal, but at the same time, very funny. So I think that's great. What I wanted to ask you, sorry to step on your toes for asking questions, but you're not really good at it. So I'm going (laughs) to step that up. Are your siblings married? Um, or is it a combination? Some the, married, some not. Because my uh, brother and sister are both married. My brother married for a long time. And I don't know if there's any significance to that coming from the same family, but I'm curious with you. Uh, I think seven of them married, five divorced. So we're already over the you're, over the I norm. think you're right how, at the how average. How many of them are listeners? Right well, that's average. five out of ten, but only seven got married. How so, many solo listeners now? Uh, yeah, pro- yeah, six. <laughs> um, I don't think that we're my, far be it for me to speak for them, but I don't think that we're well suited the way we're raised, but also temperamentally, we all have kind of barbed. Yeah, I think the term is so. There's this in the there's this thing called the Big Five. It's this well-known personality scale, and so there's dimensions that you're familiar with, like introversion, extroversion. Mm-hmm. 
conscientiousness, openness to new experiences. So comics, for example, are very high on 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 openness new, to new experiences. <laughs> Maybe not as high on on conscientiousness as you might imagine. Um, neuroticism, and then um, the last one is called agreeableness. And so, Could, uh, agreeableness, I'm a little low on, uh, like the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. And, and and there's a genetic component. When you say them. agreeableness, do you mean agreeing with people or just uh, letting them do what they want to do? No, it's more of, it's more of an emotional affective thing. Just like um, how sort of how kind of light and happy and how um, Why your willingness would you use to those like terms jovial with a comic. To, but you're I mean, I'm like I'm would be the 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 logo a pers- yeah. for, <laughs> a for person who's, who's well, who's, you know, this is one of the things that. You're pleasantly disagreeable. Yeah, you're, yeah. I, I make it funny, but people who it's and it's but also you're comfortable a thing with conflict. How much for example. you know people, right? Like like Jeremy Hotz, if you know yep. Hotz, the yep. most neurotic. Yep. Crazy, and I love Hotz. Yeah. And Hotz said to me one time, he said, "Man, the reason we get along is because we're the same." I'm just vocal about it. Yeah. And he's absolutely right. Like yeah. I am just like Hots, but Hots is, he lets you know how miserable he is. Yeah. I just hold it in and, and kind of sh- fire barbs at you. you, you know? You'll put, I, you'll put a tuxedo on it. You'll put some ice on it. You'll put, right. you'll <laughs> put it in a nice glass. Whereas Hots is like, Oh, what the fuck? That's funny. So, um, I, you know, so I write about three mics in, in my new book, stick to business. And I talk about it as a reversal so um, one of the chapters I call reverse it. And so how comics produce an opposing perspective in, in their comedy, whether it be jokes or premises and so on. But then I talk about a very specific form of a reversal, which is turning a bug into a feature. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you did. Yeah. And it was the, the impetus, which I hope that you improved a little bit in the book that the explanation of it was that I, because I read cold, all the things I read, uh, disagreeable, cold, whatever. I was like, ah, let me, I, I'm with you. <laughs> that is true, but let me explain why. Yes. And here's why. And then once people saw that, they were like, oh, right. I thought you hated me. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, my, my face, my face just doesn't agree with me. A resting dick face. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was turning that, taking this thing of like what, all the things you don't like about me. And leaning into it and going like, here is the, here's the uh, explanation or yeah, the sure. causation. And but the thing about it, what Alonzo was was talking about is the average average person, even the average comic, doesn't think to do that. Well, yeah, nope. and that was the that it was going like I need to address this in some way. Yeah, right. and it's- part of the reason is I, I'm not I don't have the I I this is another thing I was thinking about today, which is the. Um, you clean it up, you, the the yeah. anger, the disagreeableness. Uh, I don't clean it up, and I try to make it fun in the not clean up, but I still could clean it up more. And the thing is, and it's not necessarily just that we don't think to do it. It's that we don't know how to do mm. it. Like I think comics are generally introspective people, so mm-hmm. we're aware there's something broken inside. Mm-hmm. But Neil found a way to say it. You know, yeah. I, I recently watching Gary Goldman, right? Watching yes. him do the Great Depression. And Gary's an old friend of mine. And we both have the same thing of being the little guy in the giant mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. But he was able to put it into words. And yeah. I watched him do it. And I was like, damn, because yeah. I want to do it. But now I don't want to do it because he did it. And I don't want to make it seem like I'm doing what, you know what I mean? You what can't. He did. Yeah. But I understand. But yeah, I live with that every day, right? The little guy in the giant body, he put it into words. The the three mics, the the what's behind the what you perceive as anger. You're like, why is Neil always mad? Well, he's not. But this is what's going on behind yeah. it. And you put that into words, and, yeah. and it was done well. So I think the introspection, finding a way to put your introspection out there is a brilliant thing to do, mm-hmm. but it's not easy. No. I'm doing a new one now. Uh, once okay, this, enough. You did Once it. this All pandemic right. passes. <laughs> uh, that's not, um, it's not like, it, it's not three my, it's it's basically just a, a level of dealing with all these these things that people say are negative it's like i don't follow any norms Mm -hmm. i don't there's i there's no there's very few areas in which i do the normal right thing 
and it's kind of explaining all that stuff. Like, I don't, I don't drink. I don't eat meat. Uh, I don't really want to get married. I don't want to have kids. I'm, I get along better with black people than white people. Black people Clearly, like it. As, as black people, I haven't podcast. looked. At, I looked at Peter once. And the rest of the time, he's been staring <laughs> a lot. So, um, uh, there's just a lot of areas in which I don't perceive that I'm not a good liberal. Like just all these things that, like, I don't feel like exactly. I don't really fit in anywhere. So it's like Zero reckoning with that. that. That's great. Yeah. And another thing, and it's getting back to the relationship thing, right? Is when I say it's not you, it's me. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, really, like I have yeah. spent years working on this. It is me. Like I am, ve- I am aware I've been in therapy and recovery and this like, no, I'm not just saying this. I, I can show you written history. Yeah. It's me. Take yes. my word I've for it. I've got the diaries. <laughs> the other, yeah. the other, they, they don't, but, but they don't want to hear that. They don't, they dismiss it. You know, I've, it's I've, very, the, it's, the, it's hard for human beings to not take things personally. I think the big lie that society tells is uh don't take negative outcomes personally but take positive outcomes personally. yeah, yeah. you have to do it's what's like the, well it's I one can't. of the four agreements right is uh don't take things personally whether they be negative or positive yeah and that's but people but pe- that's like why manic depressives go off their meds because yeah, they want the ups well someone told me that in in comedy early on he said listen when you read the comments don't take the positive if you can't take the negative. They said yeah. that's what they said. Don't read the comments because no. you have to give credit to both. And and I think as a comic, or definitely for me, I always give more credit to the negative ones. Yeah. I breeze through the positive ones, but the negative one, I'll be like, damn, and just lock in on that. So so yeah, the best advice I was given was like, don't read the comments. Yeah, you know, there's a so you show up and stick to business, stick to business also, Alonzo. In a, in a lesson I talk about called create a chasm and the idea that, that good comedians create chasms. That is, they're very good at making their audience laugh. And by virtue of making their audience laugh, they recognize and are comfortable with the fact that there's going to be a whole bunch of other people who are not happy with them. And, and so I wish there were more of those. More comics like that. No, more people unhappy with me publicly <laughs> in order to build my name. Well, so so that you were talking about it, it was interesting. Build my name. I like your you went medieval. I must build my name. You, well, you were talking about how um, how difficult it is to try to make everyone laugh. You were you you were saying how like these cruise ship comics have like the hardest job. Oh yeah, because it's lowest common denominator. Yeah, they're not creating a chasm. They can't afford to. Right. So you got to make five-year-old kids to 80-year-old women and everything in between laugh at some random show yeah. at 7 o'clock at, on a Thursday. God bless you. Yeah. Because you, cause from a creative standpoint, you're, it's killing you. You're, you're basically telling them joke book jokes. And that's your job. I mean, you know, it's a job. You got to make money and live. I get that. But from a creative standpoint, it's like being in one of those bands in the casino yeah that you have to play the best of the 70s every night <laughs> it's really hard oh my god yeah you know kill yourself yep <laughs> so i want to i want to get back to a few or let corona kill you um <laughs> i want to get back to a doorknob <laughs> that's right you actually said that i think that's in the book you got to make a doorknob ha- a, a doorknob funny so one of the things i want to to highlight is all three of us um have therapists or have seen therapists and I, I, I want to point that out because I, I talk a lot about this idea of being solo but not alone and that you need a team, like especially if you're not going to have that one person who's your everything to be able to operate as we do and to live a remarkable life, you need a team. And so what I'm curious for you guys what you think of that idea and who would you say is on your team, whether it be personal or professional? I there before I answer that. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, there was a thing I, because of the second episode, the author, Bella DePaulo. Yeah. The science um, of single living. Yeah. Yeah. So I got her book and I think I, she recommended another one that I've been listening to. Um, cause I was thinking about what's the, what's the difference between lonely and alone? big difference and the definition i don't know if i heard it on the podcast or in one of the books but the definition of lonely or alone lonely uh requires 
emotional neglect mm. or you feel emotionally neglected. It's a perception of emotional yeah, neglect. Perception of yes. emotional neglect. Uh, and that's the difference between lonely and alone. Because I don't feel when I wake up alone, I don't feel lonely. I don't get lonely anymore. I um, quite often feel relief. <laughs> In a, well, I don't mean. I mean, it is funny, but no, in a sense of I don't have to deal with someone else's shit right Dude, now. Dude, there are times when I'm by myself and I'm like, so I would someone's supposed to be here right now, <laughs> right? Or when you know when we need to talk, I'm like, I don't have the energy for talk. Like yeah. we have to, you know that that's. I think I what, can't keep having that conversation. I've been doing a joke where I'd say uh, the only time men say we need to talk to each other is when they're planning a bank robbery. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think that, I think the pandemic is really fascinating, right? So what it's doing, obviously what it's doing is disrupting people's day to day. And what it's, it is doing is it's highlighting kind of the goodness or the badness of your situation in many ways. So for example, there are people who are being thrust together, couples who are being thrust together. Yeah. Some of them are thrilled about it. Yeah. Oh, it's great. I get to see my partner that much more. Yeah. Others are like, oh my God, how am I going to get through this? Yeah. Then there are solos out there who are just like, don't even notice a difference in the world. I'm, I'm in that category. Yeah. You're just like, well, I, I'm just, I, I'll be honest. I'm more or less living my life as I normally do. Yeah. I'm going out less, but that's the only difference. Yeah. And then there are solos out there who are feeling, really feeling the neglect. And struggling in that. I tweeted it yesterday that you're not, just so you know, you're not being neglected. It's everyone cares about you. We just have to stay away from each other. Yeah, I've been encouraging people to, to call, to make calls. And my so thing, school. With the, the, what's unusual for me is physically being home. Yes, that's the difference. Because I'm used to traveling like every week. So just the idea of sitting in my house, I'm like, wow, it's kind of nice. Like, I didn't realize, you know, but then after two, three days, I'm like, okay, is this what people do? Like... Like, this is what the holidays how, are how supposed do you to watch be like. TV yeah. all day. Yeah. Even though that's what the average American does. Yeah. I'm like, how do you do that? Yeah. You know? I, what's funny is getting sick of TV and computer and phone and right. just reading, like reading for, I've been reading three, four hours at a time. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. I really like the, the coronavirus in that, <laughs> in that, uh, I think it's a great virus. Um, <laughs> It's, it's a top I wish 10 that there was that. more agreed to moments of everyone putting the sword down. Yes. Other than first responders and all that stuff. Like, I, it, this is what this, it feels like the day before Thanksgiving or Christmas Eve or something where everyone's just chilling the fuck out. And I'm lucky that I don't have to worry about money as much as most. Like, so. Sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a luxury. luxury. Yeah. yeah, it's a luxury. Um, and but I I wish there were more sanctioned breaks like this because it yeah, makes you a, a feel your unplug. humanity. A yeah, to unplug. My, my point in bringing this up is what it's doing is sort of shining a light on whether you're you're living life from a position of strength or a position of weakness, right? You don't often know how good your life is until things go sideways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, um, so getting you back know, to what's that? Well, I just want to touch on that. I I think I do. You you have Seriously. appreciation for how good your life is. Seriously, that's yeah. good. That's great. Yeah, I um, you know, it's the work you've been doing. Well, it's also my background, right? It's also being in recovery and stuff like that. Like I know where I could be. Like for me, for my life to be where it is today is utterly ridiculous compared to what I had and who I was. Being a working at the so. airline. <laughs> yeah, I so Alonzo used to be a mechanic. So yeah, an airline but, mechanic. But not just that. I mean, I'm talking about the whole drug recovery and being yeah. an addict and stuff like that like one of the things that you you learn in recovery is like yeah be grateful because the homeless guy is you yeah you know what that's i mean like that, that's you i could easily be that you know yeah. or the guy in jail for 20 some odd years. and i'm not talking about like i don't walk around every day carrying that burden yeah it's just every now and then i am reminded like oh by the way this is utterly ridiculous that i live this life because one turn could have been that yeah mm -hmm. You know, I so, wish I had so more gratitude in that way. That that helps me with gratitude. I always say that the only time people really change and or have gratitude is if they go to twelve step meetings or if they almost die. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I feel like yeah, you've, people who have both. almost died or been really sick, they they or have an accident and recover, yep. they're like, wow, like yeah. 
suddenly none of this shit really matters. Yeah. They're like, really? You think that's important? Let yeah. me tell you something. I, yeah. So I, I wonder <laughs> if it has to be that profound. Like, I'm wondering how much change, personal, professional change, is going to be set off by just the threat of these things. Like, I think it's at, going at, to be... Like high. how many divorces are going I think to happen? It's going to be people I think starting it's new be businesses. One would hope if there was a positive, that the positive would be people remember. Like one of the things that I'm not liking is, and and we're doing this, our government is doing this, and people are doing this individually. Rather than coming together to help, we're isolating and and getting mine. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, like the the person with the pallet of toilet paper is like, yeah. Are we I encouraging gotta, I the worst? Are we encouraging you know? the worst of the worst behavior from four months ago? Right. Uh, right. Are we I, taking a capitalist? Ethos and and into why, this? I would hope that we would learn. Like, yeah, man, let's. You know, I I, I got six rolls. You know, here's two. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, yeah. it's like, look, I'm a single man. How much can I shit this month? Yeah. You know, if you really need one, I got you. Yeah. yeah. I think. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I as the probably the most optimistic person in the room. I think the sad thing is that we're not getting enough of the images of people helping out of the, you know, no one no one's taking pictures of full aisles of food and posting them on Instagram. And so it's what it's happening is it's you know, it's just amplifying all the uncertainty and scariness yeah. of the world. Um so I want so Can just we, to finish the last this last bit is yeah because I, I definitely have a team so I want to get back to oh that. yeah, yeah. It, I knew there was a question um, I want to wrap up one other thing just which is my my family life childhood was you know divorced parents and a mom who never pressured me into getting married she pressured me into everything else she guilt tripped me and tried to control my life in in every other single way um, but that was one way that she never put pressure on me in part because I think she lost faith in relationships after the end of that relationship. And um, one of the, I think the things, speaking of gratitude, I think I think the three of us could easily sit here and marvel at how good our lives turned out. I, there are moments when I do. Uh-huh. Uh, and. Yeah, uh, I do regularly. One, one I mean, it, the ni- to say it's in the 99th percentile is not even... Yeah. It's fucking unbelievable. And, you know, for me, I mean, it's, you know, I am by virtue of calling this podcast a single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm saying that I believe my life is remarkable, at least remarkable enough to be able to talk about it and try to give people some guidance in terms of doing that. My joke. So your alternative life, Alonzo, is the homeless person or the inmate. My, mine's not as dire. My my alternative life that I have in my head is managing an enterprise rent a car. Like when yeah. I think about when I plug all the variables into the linear model that predicts what my outcome in life should be, it's that. Like I'm good at it, by the way. It's one of the the more profitable enterprise rent a cars. I bring a lot of vigor to that job, but it's nothing like it turned out. Well, I um I used to see that I had briefly lived in suburbia, right? Like in, you know, model three houses, model one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. And I used to see people and I used to say, Man, if your life is going from the cubicle to the cul de sac, I hope there's something that makes that worthwhile. Like could it could be family, right? Some people it's, are just yeah, super happy. <laughs> Some people are super happy with their family or this, but I'm like, because to me, yeah, that's a that's hell to me. But to that's what people do. People do it all the time. So it's like, I hope something makes that mm-hmm. fulfilling. It's the l- most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, and, I, and yeah, that is the, I think that that is massively true. And I think my hope is that the, the quarantine leads people to go like, oh, fuck, what am I? It's a, hopefully a reset for people. Yeah. I just, uh, I just talked about in a recent episode about this Confucius quote, I'm going to get it wrong, but it's, um, it's you have two lives, and the second one begins when you realize you have one mm. or one life. Yeah. And I yeah. think I'm wondering, will this make people realize, boy, I only some, have one life? Some it, people, it of will course. affect some people that way. Some people will go right back to whatever their normal was sure. prior to this. They might even grip it tighter. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, let's get back to that idea of a the team, team right. because I, I think it's an important, I have these sort of principles I've been working well, on, and one of them is this idea of make a team, be interconnected. And that it becomes even more important. And in the Bella, in the Bella DePaulo episode, she actually talks about this. 
that single people, the myth of the solo is that they are alone and they're lonely, but the average single person is actually more connected in the world. They have more friends, a diverse group of people they can draw on. They're more likely to to volunteer, like they have time and energy to do things. That was great. That are remarkable. I love that great. stat that single people volunteer more than married people. Yeah, yeah, That's fucking great. So I'm curious, do you, I, um, who comes to mind, or what, do you have a? Well, uh, the first person, my business manager, I I describe her to everyone. This is my paid wife. She takes care <laughs> of my life. This is the life. woman that you wouldn't marry. No, that was the no. accountant. Okay, no, that was an old got accountant. It. No, this, no, this, yeah, that's a no, you different, divorce, one. completely her. different. Yeah, but, got it. But she handles, you know, my bills, my my household, my when things pop up, you know, she she takes care of it. Anything from like I need a new cell phone to refinancing my mortgage to you know, or I got to have a plumber. Boy, you know, like all I'm, of that I'm, stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm envious. Oh, she's and and I found this out. Like it started out as a business manager, and then I would just mention things, and she'd be like, "Oh, I do that. Oh, I do that." So then it became a thing of oh. Okay, when I need anything, the first call is to Liz to see if she does it. And then if she doesn't, then I got to find someone who right, does. Right, that's you know? So she has been fantastic. But yeah, I work with, with a therapist and at various times I've worked with a trainer or this or that. So I always joked about, oh, I'm a mess. It takes a whole team to keep me going. Yeah, no, no. I think you know? that's but right. But that's the and what about it. And I'm, And again, this is where we get into the finances and so forth. I'm fortunate enough to be able to support that, even though it's not, you know, I'm not one of these people that has a personal assistant follow me around every minute or anything like that, but I'm fortunate enough to have these people and be able to uh, take advantage of these things. And what about the personal assistant thing? I don't, I have friends. I think I could afford one. I don't want one. I don't, I really, what's been funny about the quarantine thing is like, I don't, sometimes my phone will ring or buzz. and I'm like, what? And I haven't (laughs) talked to people in a day. (laughs) Like I'm realizing, oh, I'm really uh, ori- oriented toward solo living. Yeah, I the the personal assistant one I have mixed feelings about. Like I I I value freedom, autonomy almost over everything. Yeah, like I'm, I've, I've, my any, old email was Neil be free. Yes, I think I still send yeah, emails to that. You thing. might, yeah. <laughs> the uh, yeah the uh, the. So anytime I've ever been given a choice between power and freedom, I've always chose freedom. Anytime, like anytime I really find myself feeling like money is a problem. Now that I'm after the age of 34, money stopped being a problem for me, which was very nice. But anytime I feel a pinch of money, it's always about the freedom. It's not like it's just because I want money because I just don't want to have to ever do anything I don't want to do. Yeah. I'm not there yet where, where I'm like totally free. So I don't want someone who can put something on my calendar. I I found my um the stuff I like working on is thanks to having money is I only do shit I want to do. That's great. I don't do anything. I don't even go to cities I don't want to go to. That's right. great. Like that... I'm not going I don't I'm not going to name the cities, but I go to sit uh, the only when i go on the road i go to cities i would want to go to anyway i see and and in terms of uh alternative life it's a it's a good alternative but it's being like a staff writer on a tv show sometimes i'll look at those they'll do somebody will send a photo they all sit in a conference room yeah 15 of them 10 to 17 hours a day. I joke that I never want to sit around a rectangular table under fluorescent lights ever again. Yeah, and I've done it. I did it when I was 20, 21, and then mm-hmm. thankfully I've been able to do s- stuff with partners and since then. Um, in a different way. In a, and, and we're in a room, but it's just me and them. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't feel like a job. It just feels like two people trying to solve a problem or fuck around. Or the, Before we get to your, your, your team, you know, I want to ask, uh, Lonzo, on the personal side, mm-hmm. who, personal team, yes, um, like, yeah, I've worked with in recovery. I've worked with a sponsor, so I guess that would be one. Yeah. But yeah, I have friends. friends. Family. Oh, absolutely. Um, my brother is one of my closest people. I talk with him a lot, and then I have a few friends. Uh, I have some comic friends. I have some recovery friends, and they kind of put stuff in perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, like like for instance, um, and it, this is so funny to me. It's great. My house has an elevator. Right, because it 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 does. Okay, so I have one friend. Like, where's your house? Uh, Woodland Hills. <laughs> yep, I was so, gonna say. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to say that's nowhere. That's nowhere. That's not West Hollywood. No, no. So he like if ever I have a problem, he's like, really? How's that elevator? Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like you have an elevator in your house, so you you don't have any problem yeah. on earth once you have an you know. And and we laugh, and he's you know very successful. And then I one day it realized like, don't you have an extra house? <laughs> like you have a house at the beach, you have an yeah. extra house. So shut the yeah. fuck up, you know. Yeah. But but the great thing about that is it's that person that I can laugh with and put everything in perspective. Okay. You know, the, I think that's important to have somebody or some people in your life to remind you of that, to put stuff in perspective. And he's that guy for me, and I'm that guy for him. Mm-hmm. Um, my team, uh, well, the, there's the I do I direct commercials a lot, so I have a team there, producer named okay. Tova, who's great, um, and uh, and then. Work wise, I kind of, I, I kind of do it so. I mean, you okay. know what I mean. Like it, I don't. I'm not one of these guys who's like calling his agent all the time. It has to. The good and bad news of of the my choices in life is that it's on me. I don't. I had uh, the very rarely is it incoming. Mm-hmm. Like we want you to do. There's never. It's almost you're never. hustling. Or it's just sort of I'm getting the ball is coming my way. Like I'm under the basket and I get loose balls. Like on the personal side, my friend Bijan, who uh, is in, he was the editor on Chappelle show and he's edited my specials and he's, uh, he's tried to be married. Okay. And he couldn't do it. He's like, we're not we're not built for it. You're not cut from that Like mold. We just, he's yeah. like, I tried to be normal. It's funny watching guys slowly. It's people try and then something in you just rejects it. It's like rejecting a new kidney or something where you're like, I can't, you can take the medication that will, that will, you know, that will uh, allow your body to accept it. But, but, um, he's big for kind of going like, he's out there right now doing the same thing as me and um he has a girlfriend that i think lives with him now but she he's like she understands Mm -hmm. she knows that it's not normal and and we've i've checked him at one point where he was getting too red pillish red pill is like the men's rights oh yes i've 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 gone down into the manosphere and Um, checked this world out yes it's too misogynistic it's not it's not it's not uh personal enough there's a lot so of angry like these yeah. bitch it's like dude what kind of life do you want to have um, so so just for the listener who doesn't know this reference to yeah. the red pill so so in the depths of the internet reddit and beyond there's uh what's loosely referred to as the manosphere which is these different groups of men so there's these men men's rights activists so often like divorced guys who want to have laws changed about custody and and alimony and so on they're pretty bitter um there are the mig t- mig toes mig tow that mig i like which is short for men going their own way which i like because that's more just the, a choice it's the, not like yeah. fucking there's no anger behind it some it, there's it depends. No, it, no of course it of depends. course it veers but yeah. but i think at least in essence they're not trying to it's not founded on misogyny and then the last group are sort of these sort of incel slash pickup artists the guys mm-hmm. usually younger guys yeah who are a little bit either pissed off yeah, that they can't get laid, or they're kind of reverse engineer the system to trick, yeah, women into right. thinking they're and better those than are the they ones are. they worry about snapping. Yeah, you know those because the they've ones snapped that snap on women. They've snapped yes. the, the kid know. in in Santa Barbara the, and the yeah. guy in Toronto. And although I I think the average of those guys are really they're struggling more than anything else. They just haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, you know, if you're a young right. man, it's actually it's not easy to be a young man. Yeah, but the worst thing you could do is get with a bunch of other angry men in the same yeah, position. Yeah, because it's self Right, exactly. That's yeah. correct. You're just reinforcing the incentive. Then it becomes their fault. Yeah. You know, like, yes. like that. Well, that, who else oh, are they going to That video blame of the short or, guy going yeah. off on the yeah. woman where, you know, she's like, I'm in line to get coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the red pill f- um, metaphor is, goes to the Matrix, mm-hmm. right? So the idea the is... The Matrix, um, yeah. But, <laughs> no, no, because yeah. it's the main. Yeah, some people yeah. don't know it, but that, so in the in the 
in the movie, Morpheus, the sort of it offers Neo the, who the protagonist. Does, wait, who's listening to this? Alonzo. The movie the came Matrix. out 21 years ago. They've still seen it. In the it's but true. The Matrix, just call it the movie because I don't It could be some psychological shit that only. I, I know, and also, but I'm I just only, giving Peter shit. I it's only, just you know, I like I, he's cleaning up my mess. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so, explaining why I'm So there's a moment in time nice. where where the protagonist is offered either a red pill or the blue pill. The blue yeah. pill they go back to their life, this 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 fantasy life that they think is their real life, or they can take the red pill and see the world for what it is. Yeah. And these manosphereian red pillars all say that oh, I've seen the world for what it is. It's much different. Gender dynamics are much different, and so on. But it often causes um, either a sense. A freedom or a sense of freedom and anger yeah around it that's that's all i want yeah i, I, I that, don't think the average person knows much about that right that bit of uh but that's happening. also and you're getting we're getting so much into perspective when we talk about you know i've seen life for what it is that's from our perspective you know sure. what i mean in other words most people are like yeah, I've seen life what it is, and I want to be married and have a kid. Yeah, you know that's that's life, and yeah. and, I, and they don't they don't think it's anything sinister or hidden underneath that. You know, they accept that as what it is, and a hell of a lot of them are happy with it. And I'm like, God bless you. Yeah, I that. wouldn't. Yeah, it's like I'm not I'm not constitutionally appropriate for that. That's not, right. Right. That's, exactly. I, 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 I'm I'll, I'm gonna bristle. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the point about it is is that there is no one way to do it. Right? Yeah. That's the whole, that's the point of it all. It's and, the orientation thing of like yes. the, any kind of sex, one kind of relationship. Yes, exactly. You know, the other thing is this is, it just isn't clear to me that every profession lends itself. So you guys were talking about comedy. Like there's a whole bunch of professions out there in the world that it's, that partnering up probably is not the best way to go about doing. Like it's not clear that I want my Supreme Court justices partnered up necessarily yeah i don't because i, mean, I want I them working all people, the time on being yeah. the best supreme yeah. court justice that they can be a doctor i mean people in med school it's like that's a relationship killer there's tons of things where yeah where i would it, way it, prefer if if given i'd like a, a bunch of monks to do it you know <laughs> it's a tremendous anytime you're something that is a passion yes versus a calling a job yes and anything that requires a tremendous amount of time or creativity or brain power yeah then then that makes a relationship difficult right because how much do you have to give unless you find that person who shares that who solo gets mentality it, who, yeah. who gets you know like you were talking earlier about the divorce and the, the alimony and this and that and the ones like when you're the wife who paid all the bills while he went to med yeah. school, yes. yeah, then you yep. get a piece. Get you should get, get a piece. Yes. You know? if, if you did it like a young boxer, Right. <laughs> if you supported him like a young Sugar Ray Robinson, yeah. if you were one of his sponsors, yeah, get a piece of it. But otherwise, it's like I'm never. Uh, and uh, the rest of my, the, oh, yes. I think the thing with the team, I, I don't go to a regular therapist anymore. Uh, after the after the uh, thing where I said like, what if I didn't? And she realized like, oh fuck. Yeah. Did we go deeply enough into nah, that? Yeah. That I, I think we went deeply. Okay. I think we did. I okay. mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. What if that, it doesn't feel like that's my purpose in life. And when you said that to her, she realized like, oh, cause she realized that she didn't realize how much she was promoting it. Yes. And yeah. she said, she apologized the next week. She's like, I, you're right. I'm not. And I was like, yeah, I don't want, I kind of stopped going. I, uh, not like I, I, and the other thing about therapy is you can stop going and it doesn't mean it's much like you don't have to be married to be normal you don't have to go to therapy you're not a quitter if you decide that, that relationship's not right, right for you yeah actually, which is a thing uh the thing i fucking hate about therapy and therapists is that they don't they don't incur they don't put themselves they don't discourage in context. you from going yeah. forever yeah they don't put themselves in context they don't explain that there's a bunch of different modalities that might help you they don't yes they, it's a car dealership where they're like no we're putting you in a volvo we're not putting you in right. um i have a i have an episode on how to choose a there or how to find a therapist yeah and my my guest one of the nice things that he does is he goes through the different forms of therapy yeah and then he talks about how to go about finding the right therapist for you because it's not clear how to it's do that. It's also hard with insurance and there's just it's, a lot of considerations. It's not easy to do. do. It, it makes it a miracle if you find the right one. Uh, so I don't really have a therapist at this point. I have done 12-step groups mm -hmm. uh, that were very helpful in terms of codependency. 
mm-hmm. in terms of managing my own codependency with people. I think maybe I, I don't know if I've swung too far the other way, but it is hard to know when you're, when you're setting a boundary and when you're creating a wall. It, it's just, I don't think there's ever a clear answer. Well, I think it's personal, like what, what's comfortable for you. Cause, yeah. cause it's just, that was a great description. Yeah. What's setting a boundary for one person is building a wall for another. And you got to mm-hmm. figure out where you're comfortable with it. Yeah. And also what's appropriate and what's, well, yeah. when are you being, a, when are you being uh passive aggressive or when are you just being obstructionist? Um, and, and then the, and then comedians, various friends of mine are really helpful in terms of the good news is we're all in some ways misfit toys yes and um it and and instant perspective givers and instant like oh well oh yeah oh yeah, yeah yeah like we can agree on what would be in 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 uh mixed company that would be non-comedians sure or, or people not inclined to it, th- that would be so fucking cynical. Yeah, you could. not We say things to each other that would be so cynical. A, a buddy of mine was saying he was at a he was at a dinner party and fucking shut it down. Mm-hmm. Shut it down. Like fucked up the energy for a half an hour with just a a regular what would have been a regular observation anywhere else <laughs> right yeah. well oh. that's oh i'm sorry Go ahead. no no i was gonna say co- comics my observation of comics like i have i live in this sort of world where i have one foot in one foot out but one of the things i like about comics is they're great bullshit detectors mm-hmm. and so they're really good also it's just sort of just and also great bullshit creators yeah on, as you're just side, talking the, about that the, story. the jeff cesario who's a comic I, when i first met him said that he used to go to therapy for three hours and I go, why he'd do three hour sessions? He goes, because we're comics, we can bullshit for the first hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also comics don't have the filter that people yes. worry about. I mean, even to a little extent, when me and Neil were joking about the black guy not paying child support, right? In in it's on the edge. regular society, they'd be like, oh my god, HR, you can't say that. HR, yeah, you can't, and and he certainly can't laugh no. about it or or tag yeah. it with more. You bullshit can't even understand. Where- Neil, you shouldn't even be able to understand where he's coming from. <laughs> Whereas with comedians, we're like, it would, imagine if I sat here and said, hey, Neil, that was a bit offensive. Like, yeah, <laughs> like that yeah. would be, you know, that would be it. That would yeah. be that would be. The end of my career. Word Correct. would get out that yeah. Alonzo like, was you know, offended Alonzo's during not a podcast. Something they, Alonzo's got the virus. <laughs> the, so I want to I want to wrap up with the ask you guys for some advice for listeners, and especially I think um, you you the, listening to the two of you. I think you're going to appeal to a certain type of listener. Interesting. Um, so I have I have both male and female listeners. Yep. Part of the reason I explained the red pill stuff is is um, I think some of the the ladies may be less likely have watched the Matrix. But um, but for but especially for my male, there is a documentary listeners. about the red pill stuff. Yes, uh, I read. It's on Netflix. Uh, it's on Hulu. I it's think. on Hulu. Okay, yeah, I I've, think I've it's called it. the Red Pill. I think or something. I'll, my I'll life put it in the exhibits. Yeah. yeah. Um. So my advice, and we we talked about this a little bit earlier, is so if you are the kind of person who, you know, let's say at best is ambivalent about you know long term partnership. Um, or you sort of know that's not really, you know, marriage is not for me. Certainly kids are not for me and so on. When you're having a conversation, when you're meeting someone new. So Alonzo, you were talking about this a little bit earlier. You're just sort of, you're just going about your business and you two, you, the, the two of you had sort of different assumptions. So if you were, if you were to tell people what's the best way to sort of approach living like this with potential partners. I, I'm asking this question because I think, Neil, you have, I don't know if it's a bit, but you have this like 30% idea. 70-30, yeah. 70-30? Uh, it's... Idea. And so I want to I get both yeah, of your advice. That, and that's not, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, well, there's a couple of things I would say. One, and the toughest one, is be true to yourself. If it's not what you want, then you can't take that pressure of society saying you're supposed to do it and try to make yourself, like Neil was saying, try to make yourself fit into a box that you don't fit in. I did that shit for 20 that, years. You Boy, know, that's one. 
Another thing, and I'm this still is, defensive about it. I'm I, still I, I still um, feel like I'm wrong. I I'm going to say this please. more. I'm going to say this more to women than to men. If he tells you he's not a relationship guy, believe him. Yes, because they just say, "Oh yeah, sure," but I can be like, "I'm going to be different." You're like, not no, you're not. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm 57 years old, and I've never been married, so I kind of no. Now I can do a relationship, but, but I'm not looking to get married. I don't feel mm-hmm. incomplete, you know. So, so believe when someone tells you they're not incomplete or he they're not. What, you. When you shouldn't, hey, right, when you shouldn't right. necessarily I, believe is when the guy says, "I want a relationship." <laughs> because well, then he's he's saying I want a caretaker. That's what I hear. If a, if a guy says that, that means I want a caretaker. I don't. So, I think that you should. I think that to. I think the point that you were trying to make just now was that the guy. A lot of damage is caused by men trying to think that they're better than they are. Yeah, or men who want sex but aren't willing to ask for sex. Yes, they're saying I'll give you a relationship. That's uh, yeah. I think- Ali Wong said something to me recently about relationships that I think about every day, which is clarity is kindness. Mm, I agree yeah. with that. It's That's really great. hard to remember, but but it's clarity is kindness, and it also, is it makes it, it's it's you can either have the uncomfortable ten minute conversation now, or you can have an uncomfortable ten day. <laughs> conversation yeah, yeah. also well months. what you're talking about i think that's more of the young man's game i think it is where yeah. he's gonna say anything to get laid because yeah, you get to right. a certain point where you're like just what you're talking about the 10-day conversation on the backside. you 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 learn at a certain age like this lie ain't worth it this one's no. gonna be oh man I agree i'm never you. gonna yeah. get out of this like you know and getting laid isn't that important that you're gonna lie to it and then put up with everything that from even if it's not a lie from the false projection, mm-hmm. you know, um, there, there was one thing was pointed out to me that I guess I can't do anything about, but this, uh, woman said to me, said, the problem is you do all the boyfriend stuff. Good. Yes. Yes. You're really present. You, yeah. Yes. You listen, you, you, we go places, you're, yeah. you're thoughtful, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, so, so it's like, but then, then you see the other thing of guys who treat women like absolute shit, and they want more. They're like they're lining up. Yeah. So I don't even know. Like, do you do the boyfriend stuff good or bad? Either way, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't. I think with I think you're either going to do it well or not. I mean, I think I don't think you and I could treat women no like shit for very long. No, because it because it would take a conscious effort. Yeah. Right. Because because yeah. yeah. we don't come from that or whatever. But what you're pointing out, I think, is. So, so your first thing is be true to yourself. Be you true got, to yourself you got to be clear be about honest that. honest with the person and have that, what Neil said, have that uncomfortable conversation. Yes. And, and then true to yourself is a, that's a broad, that it takes a, it takes, that a, takes a, that's takes a, you're trying to tune into your radio frequency. So it's like literally when you <laughs> turning the knob, yeah, turning to that figure knob, out exactly what your light is very hard. Cause it's, because there's so much input from the outside yes. world of who do you want, who do you want to tell people you are? Yeah. Who do you want to seem like, and who are you actually? And turning that knob requires a lot of introspection, reading, maybe therapy, maybe you know, you know what Reflecting I mean. Reflecting like, on previous. Like, very rarely do I think people are born knowing who they are. Mm-mm. Like you got to do some studying mm-hmm. and learning and make some mistakes and say, oh, yeah, this is me and this works for me and that doesn't work for me and so on. So, yeah, so it takes some time to figure that out. I, I think this idea of then for the person hearing this that you that, you know, you have obviously being tuned into behavior is important. But when someone says, I don't want this, you should take them at their word because it's going so counter to what the world is says that you should want the 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 argument i always make when people say when people think i can change them is like motherfucker you can't change yourself (laughs) you're gonna change him how's your diet going that's very funny so i will say talking about regarding this idea about about sex especially if we're talking to men you know i think a lot of men what they don't do well is vulnerability and so if you want sex, you should ask for sex. Mm-hmm. And that's scary to a guy because he might get a no. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and they also don't want to seem like they're, they don't, 
I think a, guys do a lot of of uh, PR, which is yes. guys don't want to seem like they just want sex. It's and, like guys always keep. I always tell women if there's a guy that you broke up with or he broke up with you, and he's being nice and being present now because he wants to keep fucking you. Yeah, like guys want to keep you just in case. Like yeah. it's like a it's like a the it's Chris's joke about. A dick in a glass case. Mm. So it's I, uh, a glass case. I, I mean, and I think it is important to know what you want. Like, you know, for me, I don't, I actually don't want just sex. I always want dinner, sex, hike, sex, whatever you want that an might event. be. What's that? You want an event? I, I just like sex. like my partners. I I don't want them just for sex. Yeah, I want them for all these other things, also. And so, um that that's that doesn't matter with regard to this specific point but the but the point is this is i think that when you when you allow yourself to be vulnerable and to ask for what you really want and to tell people what you really want this is your 10 minute uncomfortable conversation versus 10 day but that's even tougher for women which part the uh sex thing because men are more used to rejection Mm -hmm. you ever have a woman offer sex and you say no they lose their mind. Women are I, not. I, women cannot handle being rejected because they're not I, used to it. I got fresh texts. <laughs> fresh, still warm. <laughs> to her defense, she literally is like, "I'm not used to having feeling like I have a connection with somebody, and then them saying that they don't feel the connection." And I'm like that's the other that's the one of the one of the benefits of age is i said to her i was like i don't have as much time as you do so i have to make faster decisions and from doing stand-up you can suss people out really fucking quickly and people don't like thinking that you can suss them out quickly so if i can meet somebody and go no what do you mean i I mean i could explain to you why no but the answer is no. But you're being you're actually being kind. Of course. By saying you were nice. Yes. Wasn't it's not quite right for me. Yes. I wish you the best in the world. Yes. Because now they're not wondering. They send a text, you she send a friendly response. She was wondering why I was she really wanted to know why. Yeah, they're not going to accept that. Yeah, they don't they do that. eventually, but I mean, again, I'm not going to say all women or anything like that. Yeah, but, that's hard but, to. But uh uh, more than half of women I deal with are not they're confused by it and getting, they're also confused no. by yeah getting a no and also confused by a guy who has sexual opportunities and can be I, I said to a woman you might not believe this but I think sex with me is as valuable as sex with you is <laughs> I, I know that's oh, anathema. She, wow! I know that's my head blow almost your my mind. head almost blew up when you said that. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying 100, percent but I'm sitting here like, man, I was intimidated by Neil Brennan before. <laughs> now he's a god. That's I mean, I'm not. I'm not even saying it like I'm the best. I'm just saying I don't think you that- value your body and your time. Yeah, and your persona. this is your, this, this you is do. this is related to Alonzo uh, point. Chappelle's about, uh, dad one time said. Women think their vaginas are uh, exquisite and our dicks are worthless. Yep. It's the same. My old partner's old man. Con- congratulations on your exquisite penis. It's I, not well, even, no. yeah. It's not. No, it's I get like, it. I, I, see I just point. don't think that you're, society, the way it's set up is that women, it's the, it's the, it's the the prey predator whatever the whatever whatever the sexual dynamic is like they say no i say come on they say no I, yes. like and once you go okay or no or there it it really does it's the same way men sometimes feel about women that are wealthy where it's a bit like unmooring where you're like wait where, i don't even know where the center of gravity is yeah let's get back to your advice in terms of you want to talk to people the advice you would give to someone who kind of is embracing your guy's kind of lifestyle, they meet someone they're intrigued by. Uh, well, this is about I'm the, not, I, your 70, I think that 30 those, thing, those no? are two different, these are two different things. Okay, go the, on. The, before you meet somebody that you're interested in, you have, be, 
be prepared to never meet somebody you're interested in. Meaning, maybe it doesn't happen. I think that's fair. But, but I think I, if that's the it's the it's the i the 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 garbage we're fed by culture with you complete me from from Jerry Maguire. It's like I'm fucking complete. Well, no, I I want to say this. When I say intrigued, I just mean someone you're attracted to that you want to spend more time oh, with. Oh, oh, okay. Right. Th- that's the 70-30 thing. So, yeah, if you're attracted to them sexually and the... To me, it's like conversational and sexual. Yeah. It's, right? Those the, are the it's two a social connection and a sexual connection, right? Sure. That's what you want. Yes. I, the problem sometimes is you'll have more of a sexual connection than a social connection or more of a social connection than a sexual connection. People don't do well. You the problem with relationships is you can't say. And I actually said this recently. I said, "I like you seven out of ten, mm. and that's not enough. I'm I'm looking for nine out of ten or ten out of ten. There are people that can hustle out. You can you can Pete Rose it. <laughs> you can Charlie hustle. It. You can slide head first into third. But I don't. I've I've thought about my uh, professional connections and, and I was, again, that's another thing I said to, I was like, look, I've, I've, my, I've written with five or six different people in my life. Chappelle, uh, Mike Schur, guy named Daniel Dratch, a uh, guy named, and then like Seth Meyers, Jost, Che, the SNL guys rock a little bit. My connection with Dave is insane. Yeah. It's just insane. It's just the be- like you've seen the creative chemistry. Indeed. It's, it's yeah, that's in right. the Hall of Fame. All that shit. It's right. won the Mark Twain Prize. Um, I'm not. So when I write with other people, I know that it's not as brilliant. I know that it just doesn't burn as hot. Mm-hmm. But it's still great. But I still. But in the back of my mind, I wouldn't. Now that I've had that, I've had the thing I had with Dave creatively. I'm looking for the romantic version of that. Something that, and I've been in love three times, and and I wanted to burn that hot, and mm-hmm. it burnt pretty quickly. Uh, it burnt at a high high temperature pretty early. Mm-hmm. So you and I could tell first. It should feel like you're robbing a bank, or it feels like what the fu- it, you like where you keep looking at it like. Did I really get this? Is this really how this feels? This mm-hmm. is fucking amazing. It's the we were saying about it's more. It's we at it's one plus one equals three. That's what I'm looking for. And if it's not that, then you kind of have to let them know early rather than later. This isn't the 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 most indelible connection I've ever felt. I do feel connected to you, but I think you have to be clear about it and say, that's what I feel. And I, and then make a decision based on that after a while. I mean, I don't know, a month, two months, three months, Mm -hmm. however long you can, you can, you're, you're comfortable by the time you get, you can, once you know, you know, that's the thing. And I don't know if it's everybody or it's comic or whatever, but we have instincts and what do you write, 90% of the time? Yeah, yeah. And the, the other thing is the burning hot is great. For me, comfort. I don't mean fucking. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. I know what you mean. That that thing of like you won something or you found or yeah, like, like, I can't man, believe this. God damn. I'm like that with comfort. Like like if I just fall in with you and it's just comfortable, it doesn't take a lot of, it doesn't take effort. Yeah, the ease You're just factor. there. Instant yeah. shorthand, instant there, inside right, jokes. Instant, instant shorthand. You're there. Really, you get it and we don't have to do a bunch and th- and that's when i'm like let's not don't put anything on that can't it just be that now the minute you start putting shit on it now you're messing that for me now you're messing that up if you had just left it's it alone it's like uh somebody it's like when someone's throwing a no hitter right don't mention it yeah he sits by himself <laughs> just don't and you fucking just yeah, talk you don't about say you know there's a no hitter just shush, shush, shush. the moment you say that you're like well it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh yeah so that's the uh, trusting your instincts and that by the way they might be negative sometimes meaning the conclusions i jump to are 
sometimes they're shallow, sometimes they're they're judgmental, but they I believe them, mm-hmm. and I'm not gonna. So you can you can present them in a in a constructive kind way, but you know you don't like someone's breath, that's a fucking problem. <laughs> Yeah, or or you don't like the pheromones, or you don't like the, it, they just they dress goofy. Or again, these are all like plots, like Seinfeld plots or something. Like she's got man hands. I'm saying they can be, or like you don't want to introduce her to your friends. Well, intangibles work both ways, right? I mean, that's what you're saying, right? The intangibles they work both ways. The intangibles might be positive when you say, "Why are you attracted to a person?" You may not be able to put that into words, but then why are you Turned not off wanting that person pushing it? And you can't put that into words, but that it definitely happens and you feel it. And like you said, you know it right away, Yeah, you know, and it's hard. Once it's set, it's hard to change. That. Yeah. Yeah. I, think- I, I, if in terms of online dating, by the way, this is a tangent, but I think applicable. If you're going to meet somebody, if you met somebody online, do a FaceTime with them. And because you can tell you don't that way you don't have to go you don't have to meet you don't have to get dressed up you just do a FaceTime and you go like okay I did a FaceTime with somebody recently and I was like nope yeah so so there's sort of I think both of you answered this question in different ways but I think in valuable ways and and actually in some ways the same way so um, what I liked about what what you said Alonzo was be good about for, in the beginning what are like the kind of person you are you know, and being honest about that. And then, yeah, that's hard. That's hard to do. And it, it, you're going to have to acknowledge some negatives. Yes. And that, and that comes from a place of, of knowing who you are and a, and a place of truthfulness and vulnerability. And then Neil, what you're saying is once you're into something, paying attention to how you're feeling about it and what, and what it is and knowing that you might have to address it and it's going to be uncomfortable but that also comes from a, a point of knowing yourself and a place of vulnerability. Yeah. Right. Because I think, you know, speaking of online dating, you know, ghosting is rampant mm-hmm. in this world. And I just, I always feel like if we just all treat it as like we're all on the same team together and we're just trying to do this matching process. And all you really need to do is just go, you seem like a nice person. And I, or I enjoyed our time together. However, I just, you know, it's just not the right fit and, you know, good luck out there kind of thing, which is just a way to sort of just say, thank you, but no thanks. Yeah. And then no one's ever going, well, I wonder if he's going to call me back. I wonder uh, if she's going to text me back. The hard thing is that people don't, I've dated, I was dating a girl at one point and, and finally I was like, you're not that into me. And she was like, well, I know she wanted to be into me. Uh, I've had that. happen. She wanted. And I was like, it's all right. I was like, you're free to go. Yeah, I've had that happen. I was like, like I'm not going to push you. I know I've been you. I know when you want to. You find, like uh, the uh, idea of the person yes. more than the she was person. trying to date healthier people. Yeah. I, uh, and I was the healthier <laughs> person. No, I had one. Like <laughs> that. Like no, we, were, we were dating and we were literally sitting at dinner and we and I think I said it. I said, you know, on paper we should be together. And she just started laughing and it was like this big exhale, like, yeah, we, we look perfect. I don't feel it, but we should yeah. be. We, we check all the boxes for each other and we ended up laughing about it and we were perfectly cool with it. It was yeah. like, yeah, this ain't if happening. You don't, it's, it goes to that personal <laughs> thing of like, don't take, it's not, most of what we're attracted to, most of what we like, it was dictated like in utero. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not a, it's not a value judgment. Some the, uh, there was a woman who was begging me to tell her what I didn't like. I was like, it doesn't matter what I don't like because it's for me. It's not. It these are not right. shortcomings. You're not change of, these these are not and your get... shortcomings. These are just the, the. It's all the gears have to line up. It just didn't line up. I'm. It's not. I'm not saying change the gear. I'm saying it's not. It doesn't line up with my gear. Yes. Um, but so... why not? I, I'm. It, because uh, because of where I was born, the family of origin, Ireland, alcohol. I mean, uh, what? How many things do you want me to list? Yeah, I mean, and like, as you guys already mentioned, being a comic, your chosen profession, already makes 
you not a good fit for some people. But it's also, it's like sports. And, you know, I've had enough women get mad at me about sports analogies because men use them, but it is true. Certain people, certain players can't play together. Yes. And they can be great players, but they cannot play together on the same team. And you're like, why? I don't know. They yeah. just don't work on the same team. And then they each go their separate way and yeah. they're fine. And know? Kyrie yeah. Irving can't work with anyone. Can't yeah, well, anyone. that's a <laughs> <laughs> big, he's going to be in the big three. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I, I want to wrap. I mean, actually, the fact that we've covered so many topics and talked for so long Good is not, editing. Su- not surprising <laughs> to me, um, just knowing the two of you and knowing, I think, how few – how um, people don't have these kind of conversations often. Yeah. You know, and so I know most of the time you guys are on a podcast, you're talking about comedy and so on. And so it's, I think it's interesting to, de- to dive more deeply into this side of your, of your lives. Um, one of the things that I want to point out, just listening to you talk, is I think a lot of people are scared about getting older. They don't like the idea of getting older. Uh, and I, what I that always, ship has sailed. <laughs> uh, what I always say is, getting older is great if you take care of business. That is, if you've taken care of your professional life, if you've taken care of your body, if you've taken care of your soul. Mm-hmm. And in that way, then, because what I hear, what I like about you guys are one is the confidence that you have in who you are, um, and your confidence in, um, in communicating that, you know, so having the honest conversation with yourself about this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not good at. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. And then your ability to not only have that conversation with your partners, but to have that conversation with the world, which is what you're, you've done just now, which I really appreciate. Um, so we're not going to do any bonus material today. We've, you've got plenty, plenty of material here today. Um, so I just wanted to um, wrap up and say um, thank you, Alonzo. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. May I add two things? Yes, please. Here's bonus material. <laughs> um, if you're married, if you don't have children and somebody with children says, when are you going to have children? Say, I don't know. When are you going to adopt okay okay that's one defense (laughs) other defense is when people go what are you gonna do if you're not married and your loved one is in the hospital they won't let you in to the into the room after hours unless you're family and i my response to that is they will if i give them 40 bucks So there are ways around everything <laughs> that are uh, that, that are, are less profound. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to I think it's a Muhammad Ali quote. I'm not sure I'm paraphrasing, but talking about getting older where he said, if you're the same person at 51 than you were at 21, you've wasted 30 years of your life. I agree with that. That's good. Right. Who is that? Who is that? I want okay. I'm crediting it to Muhammad who? Yeah. You remember him. Yeah. yeah, yeah he yeah. used to fight. Yeah. yeah. White but, people. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's I love what Neil said. 40 bucks? Yeah, That's I'll cool. give him $40. That's cool because I was going to give him 50, but I'll save <laughs> yeah. 10 because I'm going to be older and I'm I not, usually I, I don't have the same but I don't want to big time anybody. No, 40. Yeah, 40, 40 is good. I like the idea of problem solving this in the in those ways. <laughs> yeah, just going, okay. It's yeah, if you were if you were when 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 parents try to sell themselves as selfless, just go, oh, really when well, you should adopt. All right, guys. This is great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you. Thanks, buddy. Cheers, Thanks, Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes, go to petermcgraw.com. Please subscribe and share with your single friends.